Pennywise have been an eternal force in Hollywood horror since the days of silent movies. Yet recently they have risen to new heights with the Twilight franchise, True Blood and other incarnations putting the bite back into audiences. Let's face it, there are more vampires around than you could shake a wooden stake at. With so many vampires on the loose, will Hollywood's favourite Fright Night creatures lose their flavour with audiences? Or could the genre bleed out from overexposure? Vampires are the ultimate. I mean, they're immortal. You want to sort of be a vampire. Like, when I watch the movies, I kind of want to be a vampire. You know, it gets to gnash your teeth and hiss and go all out. There's obviously something very sexual in the, you know, in the kind of seeping, sinking of fangs into soft white flesh. It's a very sexy character, the, the fact that it sucks blood. Just, I think it's all about blood and sex. I'm sensing a bit of a theme here, something to do with blood and sex. Well, let's start at the beginning. Hollywood has been obsessed with vampires since the 1920s and 30s, when films like Nosferatu, Vampire and the original Dracula with Bela Lugosi grace the silver screen. The thirst for vampire films continued through the century, even invading genres like black exploitation with Blackula. Movies and shows such as The Lost Boys and Buffy the Vampire Slayer transfused teen power to vampire tales, helping to open the current vein of hip, pretty young dead things to the genre. Author Anne Rice became the authority on the underworld with her vampire chronicle novels, two of which were made into hit films. Interview with the Vampire, which propelled Brad Pitt into the Hollywood stratosphere, and Queen of the Damned, notable for being Elia's last film before she was tragically killed in a plane crash after the shoot was complete. Audiences couldn't get enough of these creatures of the night, and they seduced men and women alike. I think everyone has a bit of a fascination with the dark side, and um, it's fun to go to the movies and escape and, and really get deep into the whole fantastical characters. And um, I myself have always loved the dark side as well, so I think it's something that everyone secretly longs for and wants. Blade created its own genre as a trilogy of superhero vampire action films based on the Marvel comic, starring Wesley Snipes. And it was seemingly one of the first efforts to really understand vampires and demystify them. I wanted to try to treat it in as realistic a manner as possible. I know that sounds a little outrageous given the context of these films, but in a lot of vampire movies, they never uh, took any great pains to explain how vampirism worked. I wanted to try to demystify it, to pull it away from the kind of Anne Rice vampire films that a lot of people have been used to in the Blade movies that I've written in and I'm now directing. Vampires, they're not undead, they can procreate, they can give birth, they effectively become another species. So uh, within that framework, again, we, we try to posit a real world in which that happened and just apply that one set of extreme circumstances and transplant it on top of our real world. With Blade himself almost indulging in some method acting. By the time the movie's all over, we, we actually think we're vampires and everybody be still crazy. <laughs> You know, the, it does, you know, we're working days, we're working nights, and usually it's 12 to 16 hours, so, you know, either we all love each other or either we're just at each other's throats. So, like, if I really could bite you on the neck, I'd bite you on the neck. Other films that took their place in the vampire action film genre were Underworld and Van Helsing, which were both made at the same time as the Blade trilogy and fed audiences cravings for more bloodthirsty fare. Except during this period, the focus shifted to humans saving others from vampires. Van Helsing himself, Hugh Jackman, encapsulates our love affair with the dark side perfectly. It's been the stuff of fiction, of camp, campfire stories for hundreds of years. And it always will be. And, uh, you know, you only have to look at how big Halloween is in, in modern day life to realise that it's never going to die. We, we have this uh, fascination with the dark side, with death, with ghosts, with monsters, with, with chaos, really. And uh, that's what these, these um, characters represent. And when you get five or six of them in one movie, you know, it's pretty powerful. It's kind of cool. There is a kind of relish in seeing a story retold, you know, over the, over the years, and a new generation's perspective on it, and a new um, generation's take on what that would be like. It is a sexy story. What exactly is sexy about it has something to do with. Um, it has something to do with the sort of quiet torment of a person who is, who is, 
has made a compact with the devil um, and will live forever, but ha is not allowed to, to feel anything, can only feel pain. When Aussie Richard Roxburgh was cast in the intimidating role of Dracula, a character that's already been played by countless actors, including Christopher Lee and Gary Oldman, he relished the challenge to turn to the dark side. Dracula has to be sexy, has to be a brilliant actor. And, you know, everyone knows, every actor knows um, of the great Draculas that have been. And it's, I would say, the most daunting task of all would, be, would have been Richard's to play Dracula. There is something really alluring about that even though it's dark, it's, that there is a real sexiness there. And even though in this scene she's kind of under his spell, so therefore it's to all intents and purposes unconscious, there's still a kind of drawing towards which I suppose is just the kind of the way that people are drawn to dark things because they're kind of still, because it's otherworldly, because you don't understand it, because it's like fire, you know, and you're drawn towards it. Fans of vampire films universally disagree on the rules of playing a vampire and characteristics of the world of the undead. Pale skin, not in Blade's case, allergic to garlic, not in Twilight. One funny thing about vampires that, especially working on a vampire movie, people have seen so many things and read so much that they have an opinion on what an actual vampire is as if it's an animal or something. They say, like, a vampire walks like this and a vampire can do this and a vampire can do that. It's like, what are you on about? Like, this is just made, they're made up creatures. So, um, yeah, it was quite nice to break it down to just it being a word again. And there's so many connotations which come into your head that I mean, I tried to just make it into a kind of disease. Uh, I mean, it, yeah, it was quite fun just to reinvent such a cliched, I guess, subject. M almost every single uh, stereotype of, of traditional vampires is abandoned. Let's talk about it. The Twilight Phenomenon. The film adaptations of Stephanie Meyer's wildly popular teen gothic romances that have exploded, attracting a predominantly female audience that cynics have labelled as Twihards. These fans are so obsessed, they even admit that they suffer from obsessive Twilight disorder. All of them are. All, all of them have, are completely obsessive. So besides the casting of Pretty Young Things, which is a no-brainer, what else is it about this phenomenon that has driven legions of devoted young fans and their rapt mothers to distraction? Is it the extraordinary love story? The dashing vampire Edward Cullen's abstinence from human blood and his struggle to resist the desire for the blood of his human girlfriend, Bella Swan? Is it the thrill of being someone else's forbidden fruit? The fascination with an unwholesome relationship mixed with the desire to save the bad boy? Or is it the age-old bad boy adage, stay away from me for your own good? Well, you watch a movie like Titanic or Romeo and Juliet where two people come from different worlds, but they find a way to be together. That's what this movie's about. These Edward and Bella are from different worlds. One's a vampire, one's a human. They find some way to be together through, against all odds, and they do have to fight with other people. They have to, everybody's against them, but they're together and they're in love. So you are carried away in this mad romance. It's so powerful, and I think anybody that's ever fallen in love or wants to fall in love, you want to feel that. You want to experience it. You want to go for that ride. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's definitely part of it. I think like, I think maybe the reason girls like the whole bad boy thing is because. They think they're strong enough to take it, and none of the other girls are. Do you know what I mean? It's like they can change. I can, yes, exactly. <laughs> I can do it. He's good for me. Nobody else. Um, and that is Edward and Bella to a T. It's like she's the only one. And nobody else. So that is, and it's hard for her to be with him. It's not the. It's not easy. Mm -hmm. So she's like making sacrifices. And... One thing's for sure, right now at least. Fans are willing to devour as many vampire stories as Hollywood can dish out. And it seems to be a part of the Hollywood Cool Kids Club, you have to have played a fanger or a fang banger to quote True Blood Law. You know, it's sort of like giving your Hamlet in a way, giving your vampire. It's, you know, there's, there's been many depictions of vampires and it's, um, it's exciting and a challenge to kind of see what you bring to, to a vampire. But especially this character, I think Arrow is... Um, given that he's so dangerous and deadly and powerful. The thing that appeals to me most about being a vampire is this notion that 
It represents everything we think we want. It's the ultimate careful what you wish for because with it comes this amazing power and eternal life. But then what I always find sort of the most poetic is that what you get what gets traded is that everything that had value then has no value. Time doesn't matter. The fragility of your life doesn't matter. So things like somehow being alive isn't somehow your existence is not as important. So are we about to overdose on vampires anytime soon? It seems that the sheer variety of vampire stories lends them to the superhuman durability for exploring the issues and fears of mortals. We haven't even touched on TV's True Blood or The Vampire Diaries, let alone films like Let the Right One In, Daybreakers, Cirque du Freak, The Vampire's Assistant, or the remake of Fright Night. These films have nothing to do with good-looking teenagers having a pash, although the release of Vampires Suck, the vampire spoof film, might point to the former. While their popularity may ebb and flow, our blood runs hot for all things vampire -y. When the real world gets us down, we flock to the theatres for out-of-this-world stories, juicy and fantastic tales of the underworld, and characters that pervert the laws of the universe and scare the crap out of us. From Vampire Lestat to Edward, Dracula to Nosferatu, it seems we can't get enough of these fanged and flawed anti-heroes. Maybe all we really want to do is be able to fly and stay forever young. Now that wouldn't suck, would it? Stay tuned to Starfix for all of the movies you know and the actors you love. Broadcasting glorious high definition with 5.1 surround sound where available. For more of the best in entertainment news, check out your movie network channels. It's altogether better, on screen and at mnc.tv.